Number one, the absolute value of a function can be defined by using piecewise notation, which you can see over here on the right. Use this notation to find the following values. So this says that a of x equals x if x is greater than or equal to zero. And if x is less than zero, then it's the opposite of x. So if we plug in 10, okay, 10 is greater than zero. So it's going to go in this top part. It's just going to be equal to 10. Zero is greater than or equal to zero. So we're going to plug it into this top part of x. So it's just going to be equal to itself. Negative three is less than zero. So this is going to kick back the opposite of negative three, which is positive three. 3.14159, so pi is greater than zero. So then this is going to kick back exactly the same number, 3.14159. In order for the function to equal seven, what would the input have to be? So what could we put in to the function to get back seven? Well, we could have seven, which is greater than zero, and then would kick back seven. We could also put in negative seven, which would plug into the bottom and kick back positive seven as well. And then what could we plug in to kick back negative five? We couldn't, okay? There's no solutions to this because if we put in five, we get back five. And if we put in negative five, we get back the opposite of negative five or positive five. So there's no solutions to that last part. Number two, here are four equations of absolute value functions and three coordinate pairs. Each coordinate pair represents the vertex of a graph of an absolute value function. Match each equation of each function with the coordinates of the vertex of its graph. The vertex coordinates of the graph for one equation are not shown. So if we think about what the absolute value functions, what the parent function looks like, so the absolute value function looks like this. It's a V that hits at the origin. So this is just the absolute value of X. So now we want to go in and look at if we transform that. And so in this first one, you have the nine on the inside. So remember when you have numbers on the inside, this moves it left or right. Okay. Um, so this is going to move it nine to the right. So this is going to move it this way. So it's just going to grab this graph here and it's just going to move that vertex nine to the right. So then the vertex of this one is nine zero. So that's number two. Part B, when it's on the outside like this, it moves it up or down and it does it exactly what it looks like. So in here, it looks like it's a negative nine, but it's moving it to the right, okay? Because on the inside, it kind of does the opposite. On the outside, it does exactly what you think. So this plus nine is actually gonna move this parent function up nine units. And so that would mean that the vertex here is at the point zero nine and zero nine is not one of our options so this one doesn't have anything then um c has that nine on the inside and so this one looks like it's a plus nine but it's on the inside so it's going to move it to the left nine units so this is going to grab the original parent function and move it to the left nine units so that's going to give us a vertex of negative nine, zero. And that one we can see is number one. And then um, this last one here is the negative nine is outside. So this is going to move it down nine units. So it's just going to grab that parent function, move it down nine. And that means that that um, vertex will be at the ordered pair of zero, negative nine, and that's number three.
Number three function G is defined by the equation G of X equals the absolute value of X. R is defined as R of X equals the absolute value of X plus two. Describe how the graph of function R relates to G. So we see this plus two out here. And again, that's on the outside. So it's impacting the range of this function, okay? Meaning that it's moving it up. So this is, so R of X is um, G of X shifted or translated is another word to use up two units. So if we had, you know, G of X here, um, R of X would just be this graph, but shifted up two units. Number four, here's the graph of a function. Select the equation for the function represented by this graph. So it looks like our absolute value uh, function because we have that V. So all the absolute value functions are in a V. And this one is just moved down five units to get us to this vertex of zero, negative five. And when we move up or down, remember that's outside of our function. So these two that have the numbers inside the absolute value are not going to be correct. And when it's outside, it does exa it looks exactly like we think it should. So if it moves down, it says minus. So A would be our answer to that one. Number five, the temperature was recorded at several times during the day. Function T gives the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit n hours since midnight. Here is the graph for this function. Pick two consecutive points and connect them with a line segment and then estimate the slope. Um, explain what the estimated value means in this situation. So you're gonna have a lot of different things you can do here, right? Because there's a bunch of different points, um, but it says consecutive. That means one's right next to each other. So don't take this one and connect it here, okay? You need to connect it to the one right next to it. So I'm just going to pick um, maybe this one and this one because the reason I'm doing that is they're closest to these lines. So that's going to be easiest for me to estimate what they are. Um, so this one's Y value is at 50. Okay, so this one's about at 50. And this one's Y value is about at 40. So that change is 10 in one hour, right? Since that was consecutive, so we did one hour apart. Um, so the slope of this line is going to be 10. And this means that the temperature, and it's really negative 10 because it's down 10. This means that the temp dropped 10 degrees in one hour. Now it says pick two non-consecutive points, so ones that aren't right next to each other, and connect them with a line segment. Estimate the slope of that line and explain what that estimated value means. So then if you wanna pick you know, any non-consecutive, so I'm gonna go from this one all the way down um, to this one. So now when you're looking at the change, Okay, so this kind of top Y value is 70, this one is 40. So that means that my change in temperature is 30 degrees, okay? So it dropped 30 degrees, and really I suppose I could write it as 40 minus 70. So where it ends minus where it started, that's going to give me that negative 30. Then we need to look at how many hours this is changing, okay? So what hours of the day is this? And so this looks like it's at 17, right? Because this is 17.5. So right before that, I would say is 17. And this would be 22.5. So I would say this is 23. So the difference there, 23 minus 17 is five hours. So it dropped 30 degrees in five hours. 
which simplifies to negative six or dropping six per hour. So if I divided both of those by five or just did negative 30 divided by five. So this tells us that it drops an average of six degrees per hour. Number nine, a tennis ball is dropped from an initial height of 30 feet. It bounces five times. So we've got an initial height of 30 feet. It bounces five times with each bounce height being two thirds of the height of the previous bounce. Sketch a graph that models the height of the ball over time. Be sure to label your axes. Um, and so we've got the height. So this side here is gonna be height. So make sure you label that. So your vertical axis is gonna be your height. And then we're looking at it um, as the number of bounces. Or time, I guess. Because it says, so this says models the height of the ball over time. So we should probably do time here. And um, so then you just need to start with your initial height, zero your ball is at 30. So pick somewhere on there to be 30. Then your ball is going to drop, right? And it's going to bounce. And then it's this bounce height is going to be two thirds of this original height. Okay. So then we're going to bounce up to two thirds of that original height and come back down. Okay. Which is really 20. So 10, 20, 30, two thirds of 30 is 20, but you can just kind of sketch how much that is. Okay. Then bounce again about two-thirds of the height so think about splitting this into three equal kind of pieces so if we kind of think about splitting this into oops three equal pieces then two-thirds of it would be you know to the second chunk of that so if you're thinking about a little bit more than halfway is what you're kind of thinking so that's one two okay so this is one bounce two bounces three bounces whoop, that's a little high three bounces four bounces um so let's do one two three four so this is the fifth bounce and then it would go back down so just getting a little bit shorter each time two-thirds of the height and then five different bounces Number seven, here are two graphs representing functions f and functions g. So let me highlight these so that they stick out. So here's f, and then here's g. Identify at least two values of x where g is greater than f. So we wanna see g being greater than f meaning above f okay so then the the graph is going to be above the yellow one so we see this whole kind of chunk in here that's above right so here's where they're equal to each other at x equals negative two and three is where they're equal and then anything between those the g function is greater than the f function so then you can just name any two x values so you could say x equals negative 1, it's higher than that, and you could say 2.5. So it doesn't have to be integers, but anything that's bigger than negative 2 and less than 3 would be good to choose for this one.